all, this is Witch Nikki. And I'm trying something new with reading this book here by my brother, Steve Trick. The last summer of World War II. The only different what sitting like this maybe. Um, having it like that so you could kind of see me because you may want to stare at the book the whole time because it's kind of like I'm not even here. I don't know. If you don't like looking at me, that's fine too. <laughs> the Whittler, the Frog, and the Beast is this chapter. As I've said before, I think I've had three parts now. This will be fourth part. Um, so let's just dive right into it. It's a few pages long. So, um, As you know, this was written by my brother. A, an account of what he remembers or put together in his mind growing up during the time of World War II. Um, so let's carry on through here. There's no um, numbers for the um, chapters, it's just titled. So, <clears throat> The Whittler, The Frog, and The Beast. Saturday, May 12th, 1945. Top movie, National Velvet, starring Mickey Rooney, co-starring Elizabeth Taylor. Headlines, Yankees crunch ahead in bitter Okinawa battles. The rain lasted several days, so this Saturday morning was muddy out, at, but sun drenched still. Our budding visionary knew his mom would be angry if he tracked in mud. So he was allowed only on the sidewalk or parking lot. He wanted very much to visit the old man sitting just outside the door and around the corner to the left of his apartment building. The old man had promised to carve the lad a sword this day. Steve knew he'd have to find a suitable wood, wooden stick for the whittler to carve on. The first place to look would be a large community parking lot. Steve would scrounge up anything that looked suitable for the whittler to carve into a sword or a dagger. I just had a mental vision of where this was. Not a hundred percent sure, but we used to pass by it a lot. Um, anyways. Okay, so. This particular Saturday morning, our adventurer found nothing lying around except a strip of wood, but there was a panel truck attached to it. Not a problem. Mom had a pry bar in the kitchen drawer she'd used earlier that morning to butter his toast. A knife. A butter knife. He's gonna go out there and try. Oh my god. I... My brother. What a rascal. Sneaking quietly past his mother. Hi, Mom. Sly move then to the silverware drawer to lift the needed tool while mom was preoccupied with her sewing. Get a drink of water. So far, so good. Now to leave before Butch could be aroused 
and blow it for him by asking something stupid like, can I go to? Or, where are you going with that butter knife? <laughs> Soon he stood sheepish, sheepishly in front of the whittler as the old man asked with a look of probing quandary, where'd it come from? The wise old man was born several years after President Lincoln was assassinated. The whittler had a reddish complexion, complexion with sun-weathered skin that spoke of wisdom and years of out of doors. The man's voice was soft and reassuring. He always had on a slightly worn Stenson fedora and occasionally chewed tobacco taken from a small cloth pouch with pull strings that was kept in the lower right vest pocket. I don't know, the hooligan answered. I just found it back by the incinerator. <laughs> oh my God. The whittler knew where the plank of wood had been found and handed it back to young Steve, suggested it be returned. Our young ruffian, ruffian had no idea how to connect the plank back onto the side panel truck from which it had been ripped from. So he tossed it through the open window onto the front seat and left. Oh my gosh, I could only imagine the poor person what came out with that truck, found that piece of wood. So to the incinerator, Steve ran, digging in the rubble for a decent piece of wood proved to be lousy pickings for flat whittling lumber. Digging around, he managed to cough up a stubby tree branch, not flat like he preferred, but so what? The boy was getting impatient. The old man would be leaving soon, and he didn't want to wait another week for his sword. Our young soon-to-be pirate's heart sank when he returned to the empty nail keg. The old man had taken his sitting pillow and left. Fighting off boredom was an adventure in creativity. Sitting on the rain-soaked wooden stoops in front of his apartment with his chin holding down the palm of his hand, was a way of life for the feeble and unadventurous. Staring into space, the lackluster lad was at his billet gazing into the unpainted planking surrounded the porch. Attracted first by its chirping, then, oh, he was straining to distinguish something crawling up a wet beam of wood. He'd been familiar with these things. Old people called them frogs, of course. Old to him was his sister Sandy, or anyone over the age of six. Steve peered at his new... acquaintance. The adolescent green reptile had no idea he was about to become the latest member of the Payne family. Gently, prison bars ever so lightly closed in sunlight, the sunlight away from the lone amphibian, careful to so as not to hurt his new friend the boy jailer peeked between loosely placed fingers. <coughs> the reptile had resigned himself to the adolescent captor, only to wait for what folly may pursue his destiny. 
on this particular Saturday, our lad's mother, he could tell, was feeling pretty down in the dumps. The caring son suspected not getting her monthly allowment check again weighed heavy on her mind. Jenny was busily hemming on a Singer sewing machine, the kind with manual foot treadle. I'll stop there for a minute. I remember that, and I learned how to sew on that Singer sewing machine with the foot pedals. It was not electric. It was really old. While in New Mexico, Sarah had given Jenny a new machine and taught the young mother how to make her clothes from a pattern. So Jenny took a sewing, it took in sewing for extra money, and she was an excellent seamstress, which is true. And she used to make a lot of my clothes, which were always made fun of at school. But I had some of the most beautiful little creative dresses that my mom made even without a pattern she okay. used sorry I forgot I had a Spotify on and it went to a commercial so um, oh yeah she used to make my um, dresses some of them created out of her mind by um, using newspaper or um, brown paper bags from the market. She used to draw out patterns herself and make me dresses. Oh, the memories there. I loved my clothes. Don't get me wrong. I, I was sad that people made fun of them because I thought they were just beautiful clothes. And, um, I had one little dress that she made. I just loved wearing that. I wore it and wore it and wore it. It was made out of velvet. And it had a twirly, I called it a twirly skirt part to it. And I just love twirling around. And okay, I'll get back to the story. But she was, I'm just, I'm just agreeing with my brother here. <laughs> she was an excellent seamstress uh, yes okay Jenny took in sewing for extra money and she was an excellent seamstress thanks to her very good friend Sarah Mae Dalton the busy mother received a large bundle of clothes every week from neighbors. One thing the village had plenty of was children who needed clothes repaired. Jenny was into her work when her number one son began his cheering mom up routine. In fact, my mom used to take in not only um, clothes that needed to be sewn, but also like laundry. And she did ironing for people around the neighborhood, even when I was a child. Um, but later on, she went to work. But, I mean, outside the homework kind of work. She, she did this kind of work. I remember her doing it. <coughs> the neophyte art, artiste stood quietly erect in front of his mother, staring, waiting to be recognized. Mom, 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 what is it? Can't you see I'm busy? Her impatient son was very aware of, his, of the sadness in his mom's face and eyes. And since it was in his nature to want to see his mother smile now, it was his time to shine. He would attempt to make her smile with his gift of a live emerald keepsake. Whew. 
in response to her question, can't you see I'm busy? Or not so clever short person comedian, our not so short clever, our not so clever short person comedian tossed the green reptile up where Jenny could see it better, directly over the tabletop. After all, how would she see it down here where there was no light? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <sighs> the newest Green family member landed right in line with the needle that was bobbing rapidly up and down, close enough to where its webbed foot was instantly... <laughs> no! Oh, my God! Stitched to the pattern being worked on. Well, this did make it very difficult for his mother not to see. His plan was quickly sliding backwards. Steve had never seen eyebrows in the middle of his mother's forehead before. <laughs> oh my God, this wasn't good, the boy thought and he was pretty close to being great. Within seconds, the California barking tree frog became a Southern California spade foot toad, and Steve, well, our ill-fated do-gooder companion, became owner of a warm buttock and ruler of the North Wall in his bedroom. The rules for his punishment were simple. Put your nose in the square pencil mark drawn on the wall. Don't touch the wall with your hands. Don't talk. Stand there till I say you can leave. Move from there and you get another of the same on the behind. Sandy and Butch stood guard and received a reward of milk and chocolate added to it if they saw our bad luck clown boy move. Do you understand me, mister? The perplexed Jenny sternly inquired. Yes. I didn't hear you. Say it again. Yes. I never knew this side of my mom. Never. Um... After I came along, she was all peaches and cream, and just sweet and honey and sugar and everything else. <laughs> she must have been waiting for the right one to come along. <laughs> the one thing that made this lesson even more bothersome for Steve was the fact that the pencil mark his mother had drawn was on the corner of the rear windowsill, making it inevitable our young cohort was to stare at his nemesis on the hill for the rest of the morning. Except for two or three trips to the toilet, our boy spent the entire day in his room. <sighs> Weekends, Jenny worked at Gilfillan Electronics making pretty fair wages at 75 cents an hour. They all talk about wages not being enough at whatever they are, 15 or whatever. Okay. She was very good with her hands, and the company made her an assembler lead lady. Monday through Friday, Jenny caught her bus ride to work in front of the children's center, often referred to as the daycare. Daycare was set up next to the village as a child drop-off for single working mothers. The center had four foot high chain link fence that extended approximately 100 feet along all four sides, enclosing 
two single story buildings which were at opposite ends of the center. The daily morning walk through the projects took the family of our four old lady blacks apartment and past the row of alphabetized buildings starting from A through G. Each building had their appropriate letter painted black on either end of the building in one foot high letters. Sandy, Steve, and Butch, along with a dozen or so other children, would wave goodbye to their mothers as the morning bus pulled away. The bus would be filled with mothers as it headed toward Gaffey Street, where where it turned south and disappeared out of sight toward the shipyards. To Steve, day camp was just a way to pass the time while waiting for the weekend to arrive when he could visit with his friend, the Whittler. Jenny usually picked up her brood up from the center between 5 and 5.30, None too soon for the number one son. Steve preferred talking to the older mentor rather than the kids at the day camp. He felt the old man was important. He knew the old man had more to offer in the way of conversation. Looking back on it, well, maybe the connection was mutual. Young Steve had... Oh, young Steve liked hanging out and talking to the man to the man because he was an honest talker. That is to say, the old timer talked and treated the lad like an adult. As a matter of fact, the whittler never patronized the young boy. Steve was made to feel equal. At times, our boy would feel a little sad especially when the old man would finish carving another knife or sword because then the artesian would say, well, there you go, son. Now go on and play. The young swordsman often missed the leisure conversation more than the whittled prize. Steve needed the old man's wisdom for guidance and direction. The boy felt secure with the discipline bestowed on him by the whittler. He felt he could trust his friend to be there for him if he got into trouble. Well, I have decided that I'm going to um going to read another chapter. It's not very long, and since I haven't read, read for a few days, a couple of days, I'm going to read. This chapter is called Day Camp, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, Monday, May 14th, 1945. Well, here they, here they are at day camp, learning to make, to take naps on a straw mat, on straw mats, and snacking on graham crackers and milk. Playtime consisted of playing on the small asphalt playground with white lines painted on the black tarmac. Or if brave ones chose, they could play way off to the to one side in the half stand, half dirt, half sand, half dirt play area. This sandy beige loam area was a breeding ground for black and yellow striped hornets. Very seldom would anyone play in the area of the hornets. This meant Steve had the area mostly to himself. No one knew why our young adventurer never got stung by the hornets, but when his, when his little black and yellow In, 
Ichnuch Gimon Hymenorpitan, whatever it is. Um, Betty's, oh, I guess it means hornet, but in fancy language. Or Latin. Why are they always putting it in Latin? Buddies came crawling out of their holes in the dirt. The inquisitive Steve would simply cup them up into his hands and be aware of their buzzing, then toss them into the air. He never hurt them. They never retaliated. There were only a few moments recalled in a day camp worth remembering. One was saving Miss Warner from one one inch long garden variety wolf spider. The rather large arachnid was just behind Miss Warner's chair when Mr. Discreet simply pointed it out to the people. Miss Warner, who was sitting almost on top of the fast moving creature, looked down and began to not really yell, but to belt out more of an operatic warble, sort of like a high-pitched noise never before heard by the young children in the classroom. <laughs> Calmly, our boy bounded into action and cupped the wayward traveler in said hands and set it free outside onto a wall of sweet peas growing over the chain link fence that surrounded the center done and done one would think miss warner and steve would have been chum buddies because of him saving her life maybe so till later the same day while playing outside in one of the many huge plywood constructed box containers which would approximately, which were approximately three feet by three by three feet, cube shaped like an oversized doghouse and painted green, also generally used for playing hide and seek or a bad guy, good guy. Today our boy was using the large container simply to get out of the sun. He had dragged out his straw nap time mat from the classroom and placed it over the top of the crate to create a little shade. While just napping inside, sort of getting in touch with his inner self, you might say, he heard a familiar voice cry out, I want to come in. It was Susie. Steve reflected that the many times he had tried to avoid this real whiny, ill-tempered, tartish vamp. Miss Warner, Miss Warner, Steve's not sharing. Okay, so now it's crowded inside his green domicile. Next, he heard a thump, thump, thump on the side of his little green hideout. Steve threw back the straw mat and peeped and peered up to check to see what the noise was. It was Miss Warner sitting on the edge of his fort, swinging her foot back and forth. The thumping noise she was her shoe heels smacking the side of the fortress wall. Can't anybody get peace and quiet, he thought. Steve turned around and around to regain what little space he had lost when the unwelcome guest boldly ho hollered out, Look! Her piercing alarm prompted Mrs. Warner to yank back the straw ceiling roof and ponder down into the cramped hideout and ask, What are you doing? Well, in this native bliss of young Steve, what young Steve was doing was standing with his mouth wide open looking stupid and confused and wondering why was Susie standing there pulling up her undies and claiming Steve, Stevie made me do it. 
before Innocent Patsy knew what was taking place. He was looking straight into the pointy end of Mrs. Warner's rapidly waggling finger, shaking toward his face. You, mister, come inside with me now. With half perplexity and half surprise on his face, Steve kept looking angrily back at the little blonde gnome, only to hear her chanting, ha, 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 now I get it all by to myself. Ugh. Although our boy was innocent of all charges, he still got community service cutting paper napkins in half to help the war effort, since saving paper for the war effort was a good thing, according to Miss Warner. This meant our confined patriot was helping win the war. It was, it is what grown-ups do to help win the war, Mrs. Warner proclaimed. Suddenly, a feeling of pride went went through the young, the young son. Helping win the war, he thought. Steve's chest swelled. I'm actually helping to win the war, he reflected. I'll be happy when this awful war is over. Then our dad will come again, and I'll suit, and that'll suit me just fine. There were words his mother had spoken, and they, and they were words that would echo loudly today, now more than ever before. Today, Steve began to believe that he could help win the war, and he knew he would need to plan and the perfect sword. Oh. I want to continue reading, but it's already at least past a half an hour here on this, this one. So I did read two chapters, and tomorrow, or as soon as possible, the lesson learned was in deceit and picking friends. So my goodness, <laughs> what a terrible thing that that girl did, blaming my brother for doing something terrible. Well, join us next time. <laughs> I hope you're liking this. If not, you don't have to put a thumbs down. Please try to remember. This is my brother. And he died. August 4th, 2021. So, in honor of him, I'm reading this book. He might have had faults we all do um, as a child and as a grown man but here he is and I love him no matter what so if you don't want to give anything like a thumbs up just walk away don't give a thumbs down that's rude <laughs>